Check. There we go. All right. Well, welcome to CBOR. Um, anybody who is going to participate, you might want to come a little bit closer to the front so you don't have to trot up to the microphone. Can you hear me through the mic? All right. Um, so I'm Joe Hildebrand, and um, this is Francesca uh, Palombini. And uh, so here's the coordinates to participate. Do we have any remote participants on Jabber? Christian, OK. All right. Um, if you're remote and you can hear me and you need something related to the microphone, we've got somebody who will do that for you. Prefix your, uh, your Jabber with MIC colon, and he will relay it for you. Um, that'll be Dave Thaler doing that. Uh, the Etherpad is on here. I think that now this URL should work. Great. All right. So we go to the next slide. Please note well, um, hopefully you have seen this more than once already this week, but there, partic by participating here you have certain IPR and other um, uh, requirements to uh, to abide by, please read this and understand it and make sure that you're following it. Agenda. So this introduction bit, uh, we'll talk about uh, Cuddle for a while, for about a half an hour. Um, we'll talk about the status of the Seaboard draft. Um, and then we've got the, the OID draft uh, and the uh, typed array draft. Um, to talk through, and then there's uh, one that I haven't read and should uh, called Time Tags, and uh, then we'll wrap up. Anything else that people want to put on this list? Anything that people think we ought not talk about? Great. I'm going to take that as good then. All right. So do you want to talk about status? Do you want me to keep talking? Uh, just a quick status update since uh, Prague. So CDDL was updated after Prague, uh, and uh, Karsten and Hank are going to present some issues that they would like the working group to decide on. Then about the CBOR, uh, it was recently updated, and um, to check that, you can also check the GitHub, because that's where the latest version is. Um, there is still the implementation matrix to fill, I, I have pinged the main list. Um, the only one uh, filling in was Joe. So um, I think Karsten is going gonna, is gonna to talk about that a little bit. But um, please come forward if you have implementations. And please go to the, to the wiki and, and fill that in. Um, um, so it's pretty bad if I'm the only one who's actually done that work because I haven't done a whole lot else. So uh, there is JavaScript in my Node Seabore um, that will generate the HTML output um, if you want to use that as a starting point. Um, so it didn't take me that long. I think it took me maybe an hour and a half, including getting all the formatting done. Um, so there are some tests in there that you can use as a you know, here are some inputs, and if you can process those inputs, then you're probably um, in good shape. Now, I don't implement all the entire set of extensions and tags, so hopefully, you know, somebody else will have implemented things that I haven't. So. Okay, about the tags documents. So this is, um, so there are two, two drafts that are about tags that are in the charter right now. So the CDDL and CBOR are working group documents right now, and the tags are not yet working group documents. So we need to talk about that, and we need to see what is, what's the status for those. And here I just reported uh, what you can see in the data tracker about when were these documents last updated, and then we would like to hear from the authors about what they think they need, it's still needed um, to go for adoption and, and 
or then working group last call. So for the OID tags, there has been no update since March. So um, this document probably needs feedback. We have asked for it. And we even, um, yeah, the, the past couple of meetings. <laughs> so um, talk about that. And um, about the array tags, um, it was updated after Prague. Still needs still need reviews. I was going through the minutes uh, for the past meetings and noted as, noticed that some people promised reviews last meeting, did not provide, maybe forgot. So I'm just gonna remind it here. Um, Jim and Paul uh, promised reviews on this document. It's it's short. It shouldn't <laughs> it shouldn't take you long. But um, yeah, so we'll talk about this one too. I think that's it from us. And we're going to start with CTDL. That's a very small <laughs> area. I'm not sure I can stand in that. If I tip over, you have to. Catch me. Okay, so um, what is what's this? No, no, it actually works. Does anybody know how to turn this on? I think it has something to do with it not being switched on. Okay, <clears throat> so if you can <laughs> try switching it on. It, it worked after switching it on in the core meeting, so um, I think it really just needs to be switched on. Okay, so um, just a reminder of what this working group is about. Uh, we, we are supposed to take RFC 7049 to standards level. We are supposed to standardize, standardize CDDL and do a few tag documents. So that's what's currently in the charter. And um, I run through this in three parts. Um, the first one is about uh, CDDL. Uh, so I'm not sure Hank is here because he has a conflict with NetConf. Um, so I'm not sure he can um, make this meeting. Um, and, and Christoph is in Bremen, unfortunately. Um, so, just to remind people what CDDL is about and give a little bit of a tutorial that is probably needed to talk about the actual issue that we should discuss today. Uh, we have been using BNF since RFC 40. Um, so, th that uh, comes uh, quite well together with it being at ITF 100. Uh, this has a long tradition. And uh, for about 40 years, we have been using a BNF, the augmented uh, BNF that, that Ken Herrenstein uh, developed for the male RFCs. There's Hank. Um, so this is something we have uh, some experience with. And um, there are 752 RFCs that reference the, the ABNF standards uh, RFC. So one, one could say this is a successful RFC. It's even more successful than Yang, which is currently referenced by 160 RFCs. There is some tool support. It, the, the ABNF format hasn't taken the world by storm, but uh, it, there, there is support. We have our own tools, uh, like uh, Bill Fenner's BAP and ABNF Gen, uh, but also uh, uh, well-established parser generator uh, tools like Antler uh, support it. And uh, it's just normal in the ITF, if you do a text-based protocol, you write an ABNF uh, spec. So this is our role model here. We, we want to be like ABNF. And actually, that, that not only works on, on, a, on a high level, but also on a technical level. ABNF is composed of productions. So you have uh, something like an address specification, and that is a local part followed by an ad side Add sign followed by a 
uh, domain. So what these ABNF rules do, they give names for sublanguages, and then you have two kinds of composition. You can compose by concatenation, like, like this does here, concatenating a local part and adds an in a domain, or you can compose by choice. And uh, this uh, nesting structure then at some point terminates at literals like the add sign here um, or weird ABNF notations for literals. So this just means uh, all ASCII characters between 30, uh, 33 decimal and 90 uh, decimal. Okay, so this production-based way of constructing languages, of course, has been with us in computer science uh, since the late 50s, when John Beckers invented it for, for Fortran. And um, what we need to do to uh, use the same technology for JSON and CBOR data structures is to apply it to trees, to trees of data, uh, and not to text strings. Um, so uh, given that uh, the data that we are using are integers, text strings, binary strings, floating point, and so on, we have to add literals for those primitive types. We not only have text strings, we have these other things as well. And we have con to add constructors for the two container types we have in JSON and Zebra, the, uh, the arrays and maps. And the whole thing is inspired by RelaxNG, uh, which was the, the schema language for XML done right. You probably know another one. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to comment on, on that one. But RelaxNG has done some, some interesting uh, work here too. So in CDDL, rule names are types. Um, you can write something like Boolean is either a false or a true. And then you have a Boolean type. False, by the way, is also a type, uh, which has just one member, the, the value false. Um, you could have something like label, which is either a text or an integer. This would be an application-specific type. Or an integer is actually uh, either an unsigned integer or a negative uh, integer in uh, CBO. So types are just sets of potential uh, values. And a literal is just a very small type. So this literal one here is a type with a one uh, member in it, which is the number one. And then there are, there are other ways of uh, writing these types. For instance, one, two, three uh, actually means a type that contains the numbers one, two, and uh, three. Um, so that's one part. The, the other part that, that feels a bit more like an ABNF grammar is the groups. The groups allow you to write down sequences of items. And these sequences of items can then be used uh, within arrays or within maps. So the, the um, interesting thing about the group construct is uh, that there is a single construct for both defining maps and arrays. And of course, maps and arrays are very different. Um, maps have um, a label. Uh, the label is ignored when you use a group within an array. And on the other hand, uh, arrays have a sequence which is ignored uh, within maps. So uh, groups are grammars for uh, key value pairs. And keys and values are types. So this is where the circle closes. You compose groups of types. And you compose types, if they contain arrays or maps, out of groups. So that, that's essentially the, the whole technology. Uh, behind uh, CDDL, and uh, the result is that you can write something like this. Um, this was one of the first examples when we read RFC 7071. Uh, we were annoyed that they had to define a special stylized form of English to, to de define their JSON data type, which takes, uh, I don't know, four or five pages. Um, and uh, so th this is the technical content of RFC 7071 on one slide. So what we have here is a name for a type. The type is rep the reputation object. We have the uh, map or uh, JSON object, uh, braces. And then what's in here is a group, 
uh, which says you can have the label application with a value of text. And uh, actually, you, you must have, because there's no question mark there. And you, you must have a label reputance, uh, which has an array of zero or more reputants in it. And the reputant is this thing with some mandatory parts and some optional parts and a wild card at the end that is there to express the extensibility. And that's really the, the, the wild card is the one thing we have to talk about. So, um, yeah, these groups get names like types get names. Um, so, uh, w when you look at a CDDA document superficially, you may not always be aware which name is a group and which name is a type, but generally that, that becomes clear from the uh, context. Um, so, just to, to give an example of why we want to finish this now, there is this draft in the RFC editor queue, which is called draft IATF anima grasp 15.txt, and that draft is done. And it's just waiting for, for CDA to get published. So we, we already have specs out there that have uh, references to CDDL, some informative, because they just repeat the specification, and some normative, like the GRASP specification. And we want to make sure that we don't destroy uh, this specification by uh, uh, changing CDDL in, in a major way. Um, yeah, and there are a few more. Um, there are actually SDOs outside the IETF, uh, which uh, cannot be named in this room, uh, but uh, you can guess uh, three letter and, and a longer acronym who that might be. Um, so, yeah, we don't want to break it. Um, and um, we don't want to put in the kitchen sink. Um, but um, currently, um, is one of the two focuses is getting the definition of the semantics of the language unambiguous. So tool vendors come in and say, yes, we can implement that. And uh, one new thing, which isn't in the internet draft yet, it's in the uh, uh, topic branch in the GitHub, is uh, Appendix B. That is uh, called matching. And uh, it uh, summarizes the matching rules that are used by CDL types and groups um, in a short way. It essentially just goes through the ABNF. Uh, of course, CDDL, as it is a textual language, is defined in ABNF. And it goes through that ABNF. And for, for every uh, CDDL construct that exists, uh, it, it concisely summarizes the CDDL semantics. And uh, what we need to find out is whether that uh, new appendix is useful, whether it is correct, and whether it is complete. So th that's something where, where it would be really useful to get uh, reviews on. So if people think it's useful, and I think the mailing list has had pretty much a consensus that it is useful, we will put this into the next version of the draft. So that's one area of work. The other area of work is actually making technical changes. And uh, so far, the appetite for that has been limited. Uh, so th there have been few people who said, have said, uh, we would like to change this and that, um, except for one area. And um, the, the, the uh, problem comes in when you add a wild card to some um, existing map definition. That's why it was uh, uh, def uh, discussed under the heading map validation, but it's actually a more general um, issue. So since this, this is a productive language based on the same concepts as ABNF, um, these two parts of the group are uh, taken separately. They are not interpreted together, they are just interpreted as they are, and the language is then constructed by taking these two, two parts uh, together, like, like in a uh, buckles now, now farm. Um, you, you know. So uh, this says, we might have an entry in the map uh, with a key of four and a value of type text, and uh, we might have any kind of uh, entry that has a, an inside integer as uh, the key and any data type, because we don't know yet how we will extend things um, as a value. 
So that's generally fine. However, um, really what, what, like one, what one would like to explain here, to express here, is that the fall is taken. So uh, we don't really want that other guy here to say, oh, by the way, you also can have a key of four and any value, because the, the four is already taken with this. Now, a, a, a grammar uh, mathematician will tell you, oh, you are making the grammar context sensitive. And that's exactly the reason why we haven't done this yet. Uh, context-free grammars have advantages over context-sensitive uh, grammars. But uh, the, the discussion on the mailing list was, this is really a feature we would like to have. It, it would really be useful uh, if, if we get an instance that has a key of four and a value of floating point, would really be good to have a validator throw an error for that, instead of just accepting it because it's, it's uh, captured by the wildcard. Now, how do we fix this? Um, th there is one possible answer, and this is a slide I, I have used last time in the list of kitchen thing, uh, thing, things we, we might want to add, uh, which is cuts. Cuts is something that is uh, that was uh, uh, initially uh, defined by the Prolog programming language, and uh, recently has become an, an item of interest for people who do parse expression grammar parsers. So BNF started out um, just as a language for defining things, then the theory was built around that, and two theories emerged. One was way too complicated, uh, way, way too expensive to implement, the parse expression grammars. So the theory veered off into LR and, and LL parsers and so on. But uh, in the meantime, people have started to do parse expression uh, grammars again. And the example here is uh, we have a data type A, which is either an ant or a cat or an elk. And uh, the ant is an array with the first element being aunt and the second being an unsigned integer, cat, text, elk, float. Now, the, yes? Yes? Oh, yeah, this should said, <laughs> of course, thank you. <laughs> okay, and, and the, <laughs> actually, if, if that were true, then this would be right. So, um, sorry about that. Um, so the, the reason why uh, we started talking about cuts in, 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 in the uh, author's team was that we wanted to have better error messages. Because right now, when you put this into the CDDL tool, it doesn't really have a good way to tell you what went wrong. It just says, this is not an A. It is not going to tell you, oh, you said AND, and after an AND, you really should have put uh, an unsigned integer. And this is what these cuts are doing. They're essentially committing to a choice that has been made. They are cutting down the rest of the search tree by saying, oh, if, if you actually saw the word AND, then really all the other rules that are in this uh, choice don't matter, because this is the one you, you should be uh, choosing. So that means if you get anything but a uint um, after uh, the AND, you know, uh, this is wrong. And you can say th there should be a unit there. So th that was the, the reason we wanted to, to do cuts. And that was a good reason, but maybe not good enough for, for putting it in. Now, the interesting thing is we can use the same construct to handle the uh, map validation issue by um, essentially inserting cuts between the keys and the values of an item in a group. So this would mean if you match the number four, then you can ignore all the other alternatives for matching this particular uh, key value pair in the map. Uh, you are done, and, and the only value that is allowed here is uh, text. So that, that's the, uh, this button, okay. Thank you. So, um, this is, of course, a little bit noisy. So this would come with a proposal to make the existing colon shortcut uh, include that uh, cut. So when you say for colon text, this means you really mean the for is taken by this particular production 
about this particular part of the proof. So that's the proposal. Now this needs to be fully defined. Those people who know about the theory know that when you do a cut, you reach up the tree and you have to define how far you reach up. It may seem obvious here, but in more complicated examples, it has to be fully defined. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing we want to do is uh, checking for breakage that this change makes. And the third thing, of course, we want to do is implement it to uh, make sure uh, it works. So uh, this is probably a month of work that, that is needed to make this happen. Joe Hildebrand from the floor. Uh, do you have other proposals, or is this the is this the only one you've got? I, I don't want to start ideating. If, if you've got other things you want to also suggest instead. No, th this is really the, the main part of, of this segment. So, I mean, if what you're really trying to do is get the extensibility bit, and you're having to sort of retrofit this in just for extensibility, like I get the 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 ant example you've got there. Um, but like, do you want the ant example enough to make extensibility? I mean, this seems relatively complicated from a theoretical perspective compared to like the cognitive load associated with this is relatively high compared to the rest of the document. Yeah, because we are leaving the context free part and entering yeah. the context. So I mean, but there are other things you could do to get extensibility if you just wanted extensibility. So for example, at the end of the, 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 the end curly bracket, you could put something else at the end that says, by the way, this is extensible in some way. Like in for example, you could you could have in parens after it some sort of type statement that says what you're allowed how you're allowed to extend. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Sean Leonard. So uh, I have a couple of proposals I want to bring, but I want to first address this pretty clearly. So I think it's valuable, as discussed on the mailing list, to have some way to uh, either cut or constrain the type. Carson and I actually uh, worked on a related problem with this in the context of A, B, and F. Um, and I would like to propose that we consider an alternative way to get the same results, namely allowing uh, the broader definition, right? The mapping from uh, the broad type to, to anything, but then also have the subtype that's more constrained, right? So one way to do it is cuts, and that's already been presented. Another way to do it would be to have a constraint notation so that you have uint maps to any, right, in the map, but then as a subclass or as a constraint of that, it's possible to define specific instances of the uint, such as four, and then uh, the, the matching type on essentially the right-hand side. And the difference is that with a cut, as I understand it, um, it's it's a way to essentially to produce better error messages, right? Because you, you take that point of the parser uh, of the tree, you output the error message, and then you back up, right, essentially. So then it doesn't match. However, another way to look at it is that the uh, data production still does match the broader type, u int to any, okay? But it just doesn't match the subtype. So then a uh, parser on the fly or, or during production will know that it matched the broader type but not the subtype. And then the application can treat that as either an error or as something that's potentially recoverable where uh, the consumer can then just realize, okay, we have the broad match but not the subtype that we were looking for. Therefore, the data uh, item is um, in is uh, deficient, basically, and get the same result. So, how do you notate that subtype? Uh, that would be uh, there is another uh, control operator that is in CDDL now uh, called uh, within or and. So it would behave in a similar way. Um, I guess I can propose a, another way to look at this. Uh, I have a draft in the ABNF context which is a uh, draft Shantek constrained A, B, and F, which ironically uses the hat. So it's a very similar notation. But the notation would be something akin to uh, uint map to any, and then hat, and then your list of specific matches, such as four colon text, three colon whatever, and, and so forth. 
that that could be one way to do. And while still keeping it a context-free grammar, that's that's also the the key you thing. You would write the the uh, catch-all first. Yeah, you you would write the catch-all first, and then you write the specific instances that also match the catch-all. So you're constraining the generic production to these specific instances of interest. And if it doesn't match the specific instances of interest, then that's a condition that then, of course, a program can can process or deal with, that it matches the general thing, but not the specific thing. So it's in the catch-all. It would be interesting to, to see a proposal. Uh, right now, my, my cognitive load gets up because I, I suddenly have something <clears throat> in uh, CDDA where the thing that comes later has a higher priority than the thing that comes earlier. Mm. Everything else in CDL is the other way around. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that could be done. Okay, good. So may maybe we should uh, work on that then as we look at alternatives to this. Because I do see that there is a use you know, that's broadly applicable to a variety of, of users. So the, the problem is that, that the, the, this type here, um, without the hat, um, is not matching. Mm -hmm. So if, if you subtract this type from that type, then then for column float is still in right. there. The point Correct. is that you that's have right. to process this type and remove the value information and just keep the key information mm -hmm. before you can construct the, the, the remainder type that you are subtracting from, from the catch-all type. Right. I don't know how to do that. Right, that makes sense. Although, if the remainder type also matches all of the other specific types, you can first match the remainder type, which presumably would also be relatively cheap relative, relative to going through the list of specific matches yeah. the, the, and the, then going through the specific match. The, the cut is essentially a way to construct that remainder type. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, so so you, you would need it in that case as well. Right. Sean, okay, so would we can, you be willing to uh, write this in a pull request or something in the GitHub? I can, yeah, the, I can try at least the, yeah, the yeah, general And then contours, we can so. have a discussion in the mailing list. Okay. And uh, actually, I want to take this uh, to, to uh, remind people to participate in the mailing list because we've seen very little participation and uh, the working group seems interested and active, but in the face to face. But then I would like to see more discussion in the mailing list and I cannot keep like for like trying to get people to talk. You need to. Yeah. So I have I have other proposals, but before I get to those proposals, I'll step yes. to the back one. <laughs> Jim Shot. Um, the first problem I have with this is you all of a sudden became extremely order dependent, which we means are. we already are. Huh? We already are. This is a positive ex expression grammar. Um, it does not matter in the current grammar if I do the star first or the four first. That, that, that those would be equivalent in the grammar. This is not true anymore. And even worse than this is you now have the question of if you have group one, which ends in a star int, you int points to any, and then you say, and now append group two to it, all of the cuts in group two won't ever be seen because you'll hit the star you end. Yes, correct. Because, and that's because of the order dependency. Right. Um, so that's the first problem I have with, with all of this. The second problem I have is I don't understand why this needs to be expressed in the grammar and cannot be expressed in semantics. This is commonly done today. For example, if you have an email headers, um, I can't remember for sure, but I believe that at least part of the grammar says you can't have two of these. That's not in the grammar, that's in the semantics. So I don't see why this can't just be expressed in semantics rather than in the grammar. Well, actually, the, the you can't have two of these semantics of maps also is expressed in the English and, and not in the grammar. But I'm not, I don't know how to do this. I mean, if, if somebody would come up with a reasonable <laughs> proposal that actually works, that would be great. Yeah. Hi, this is Hank, um, an editor of this document. Um, first of all, 
if there are good proposals, and that's basically what you just said, so basically you took some of the words out, out of my mouth, that can express this as a control to this type definition, I'm very interested to see uh, proposals for that. And then coming back to Joe's comment, this is, while it looks like this is about extensibility, it isn't. It is about uh, the fact that sometimes we have the problem that there are more well defined keys and less defined keys and maps. If it would be about extensibility, we would use the extension points. There are extension points to our choices that we could use extension points here. We could use, uh, we could use end with an extension point just as you proposed, it is already in CDDL. But that is not what this is about. This is about the fact that we have sometimes labels that are less specified than others. And those would be uh, basically gobble up all the well-defined labels. So if this, if this can be solved by via a control, and we were already considering that, actually, um, we're really happy to have a proposal for that and compare it. But uh, after a really long time of discussions, we, we basically ended up with making the colon the explicit, sorry? Can, can I add something to you? If yeah. It sure can be solved with a control. Yeah. Uh, that's easy. Yeah. The hard part is solving it with a control in such a way that you don't have to write everything twice. Yes, yes, exactly. So that is that is why we did this. We wanted we, the, one of the design principles is less noisy, and this is way less noisy because it's basically looking like before. It just has some added semantics, Jim. Uh, uh, to it. <laughs> okay. Okay, great, Sean Leonard. All right. Um, I did want to draw the working group's attention to a couple of other proposals that have uh, come up with regard to CDDL and, and the grammar. Um, specifically, the proposal that I wanted to make or discuss oops, um, had to do with regular expressions. So I did bring up on the list a few months ago the issue that uh, regular expressions currently uh, are defined as PCRE, which is great because I think PCRE is a great regular expression implementation and everything else. But there isn't a normative reference uh, in CDDL or in CBOR to that. And I think that that is something that should be addressed in both documents, because both of them do, in fact, reference regular expressions. Um, then, because of the power that regular expressions have to identify and constrain the different data productions, uh, I feel strongly that regular expressions should be first class syntactic elements inside of CDDL. So for example, just as you can do in Perl or in JavaScript, the way you write a regular expression is you do slash and then the regular expression content and then slash. And then usually if you have a editor uh, that is language aware, it'll color the regular expression and show you interesting stuff about it and, and so forth. So the technology is all there. Right now though, it's defined in a string. And the problem is that when it's in a string, there's a ton of escaping right, of backslashing that you have to do to, to make that work. Um, so I wanted to bring that up to make regular expressions a, a first class syntactic element. Another advantage of doing it that way is that then you can add the flags or the uh, modifiers such as uh, I and X and so forth on the end of it. Uh, yeah, because otherwise you essentially have to construct two strings and then put them together and then it's, it, it just doesn't look it it doesn't look good and that that alone the conciseness will uh will help i think a lot with readability and it'll help identify and catch errors and such so um yeah so that's sort of on the table joe hildebrand from the floor i like the idea of slashes as a syntactic element and promoting regular expressions first class um if we think they're going to be used enough to warrant that it's a it's a nice affordance. Uh, Brian Carpenter, user of CDDL. I think these are all great ideas for CDDL version two. <laughs> I would like CDDL version one as a normative reference next week, please. So I, I wonder if you could think about taking that approach. Yes, I did, and then I found I want to make colon shortcut <laughs> for this. Yeah, I mean, I sympathize with you wanting to do this, but I also, uh, I, well, you're a co-author on the, the draft that's waiting for it, right? So yes. you see the point. I mean, if you can, 
if you can think about doing this as a version two effort, then I think that would actually be probably better for CDDL because it gives it a place in the world and you can then work on the improvements. So the-, the Can I ask a, um, a question first? It was this a point to the, this, the Karsten, what Karsten presented the proposal and what then was answered? Or well, was this a comment to Sean? Uh, both, both of them, really. I mean, I don't see any of these as not being backwards compatible with existing CDDL. So it wouldn't invalidate existing CDDL uh, files. It would be additions. So okay. as long as it's strictly backwards compatible, I, you know, I think you can version it. So if any day you want, you can say today is the day we version it, and and then put the next lot round of things in version two. So it's really a, a choice when you do that. Okay, Sean Leonard. Um, related to the to all the things that were just mentioned is a concern I have with uh, the control syntax or control operators um, and how I think they could be made better both by the regular expression syntax and address, I think, some of these kind of CDDL V0, V1 issues. So I clearly see the value of having the control operators that are currently defined in the draft, right? For example, the bits, uh, the bits, op is it, it is control operators, right? Bits, uh, regular expression, and then uh, size, and a few other things. But in some ways, they're too uh, extensive, and they're not powerful enough. Uh, at base, however, I've read a number of CDDL specs in drafts and RFCs or whatever that have, have floated around. I'm not aware of uh, standards or specifications out there yet that are relying on them normatively, where removing them or taking them out and tweaking them is going to cause real interoperability problems. Uh, one point about the control operators I want to point out is the size uh, control operator. So right now with size, you can define it as a single size, or you can define a range, I believe, right? So it can be like three to 63 bytes in length or whatever it is. So that's fine. But I have use cases where I want to be able to constrain the size of a string or a byte string to uh, basically mod two, like only even numbers or only powers of two or whatever. Okay, just because that's, those are the increments of the data items I can do. Well, interestingly, if I use a regular expression constraint, I can actually do that very powerfully by just saying regular expression has multiples of two, right? A group of two characters or bytes and then plus essentially, or, or multiples of two. Um, I can't do that with size. And I think as a result, if we adopt regular expressions in their more powerful form, right, with the slash notation and whatnot, we can actually find that there will be um, control operators that may be superfluous, so we don't need them at all. And we might want to, you know, make all these control operators uh, simplified and just say, just use re regular expressions. And here's like a handful of uh, very powerful ones that you're gonna commonly use for these sorts of patterns. Um, so with that said, uh, that's kind of another proposal on the table, not to remove the control operators, but to recognize that there are perhaps more powerful, simpler ways of annotating the same thing. Uh, and if people really, really want a V0 or a V1 of CDDL, we can consider, you know, dealing with the control operator issue after uh, the publication of that. So, so let, let, let me answer that because it, it's really confusing. Uh, right now, regex are for strings. Okay, so yeah, so I wanted to point out as well, re regexes are for sequences of uh, code units. So you can just have a binary regular expression that operates on octets from zero to 255, as opposed to regular expressions that operate on Unicode code points from zero to 10 FFFF. Yes, right. so again, so, right now, regex are for strings. Right. My and, my view actually is that regexes could be applied to uh, both byte strings and text strings, yes. and that and that they you know they just have a different domain. In the case of octets, this, this, it's zero this, to two fifty five. Right. Um, and um, 
what we have tried to do is not turn CDL into Perl. Um, so regexes are but there for the few cases where they actually add something. Um, but they are traditionally not a way in which we specify uh, the strings in the ITF. Now, one way to solve this problem would have been to add A, B, and F to CDDL. And maybe in CDDL version 2, we will do that. Uh, but I think regex are, are there for, for a narrow domain, and they should stay that way. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to do a grammar that does this slash thing. So uh, I have to pass on that. OK. I guess I, I would just say that regular expressions are a part of CDDL. And they're a part of CBOR, too, because they're in you know, RFC 7049. So, um, and a lot of people do, in fact, use them. So although it's true the IETF has not defined them that way, uh, I'd first question, do you really need, I, I, maybe I should ask the group or, you know, whatever, have people been using the control operators to constrain their specifications in an important critical way where it's like actually normative? And have they used regular expressions in that way as well? Because regular expressions do in fact appear with some frequency uh, in other specifications. So. CDDL users, <laughs> Jim or? No. Okay. Too hard, he says. Um, this is Hank as a user, and yes, I have used controls. Okay. I would like to <laughs> hear uh, feedback to. on this from the working group. So um, I think Sean had raised this before in the mailing list, but please uh, take it up again, and we will. And users, please respond to his email <laughs> <clears throat> okay the why i stepped up to the mic in the first place was that i had a difficult time to pass the statement powerful and simple <laughs> um yeah so my question really is do, do no. we want to do this now <laughs> take take this leg out of of uh, of, of the city specification well, and I, affix it to the head and, I, and I that would not the match first with me. question is is this even is this you useful? Do people think this is useful? Then the next question is the proposal that Sean just made about Reggae. And so, then and then we can talk about is this something to do right now? How long would this take and um, if this should be something for next version or not? Right. So uh, in response to simple and powerful, how can that work, right? Well, that's always a holy grail of computer science. You say something simple and powerful, and then it turns out to be one or the other or whatever. And the, the answer is regular expressions are simple when they're simple, and they're powerful when they're powerful, right? But they are a part up to now of CDL and CBOR, right? The existence of CDDL in its current draft form assumes that a CDDL generator or a uh, parser or validator of some kind that conforms to the spec will do something with the regular expression, right? So that basically assumes that PCRE is lying around. Does that, does that make sense? So assuming that you have this piece of machinery that's part of CBOR because it's in the, the specs, right? Then that's what you got, so you may as well Make the most use of it. But does that make yeah. does that does so that make sense? Th yeah. And one, and one question that I don't have on the slides that maybe Alexei can can answer. Um, so um, PCIe is not defined in in a normative document that we can use. It also is the right spec to reference here, as as uh, shown <laughs> probably correctly as as identified. So. Uh, I'm not sure whether I want to be a guinea pig for the new let's. Uh, reference open source projects uh, policy of the ISG, but this is where it actually would fit well. I, I, I need to check. I vaguely remember there was one of the CIF documents that has regex ex extension, so I can find out what it used there. So, Thank If you. you were willing to take a slightly less powerful version, you could reference one of the ECMA Docs and use Java, uh, the JavaScript version. They are adding look behinds, um, and so you could, for example, take that. 
Uh, there, there is some rather weird Unicode stuff going on w with those. So uh, if we can avoid reference that, I'm just saying that they they are a there's there's yes. there are standard stocks to point to yes. there, which yes. is better than not having something to reference. Well, let me try to find the document yeah. and and uh, then we can have a look whether it's a good example or you know at least it's an example. Yeah, and finally, um, my concern with having uh, um, to exchange, let, let's assume we exchange controls in general with powerful um, and simple um, regex. We are talking about a domain where if we are ever going to do message validation, actually, that's that's kind of kind of too much of an overhead, maybe, in that domain. So um, um, I would be very careful about the powerful stuff in that domain. Yeah, so the, the way forward, if, if Alexei finds out we cannot do this, uh, Regex is currently linked into the document using an extension point. And uh, we can just throw out Regex out of this uh, current document, uh, finish it, and write a second document that has the Regex reference uh, in it and let that sit in the Internet Drafts directory until we find out how to do it. All right, we should move on to other things. Okay. Yeah, I, okay, that, that sounds good. I would just say, as I pointed out, not just regex, but all of control operators, if, not because they're not useful, but because maybe we don't need them right now. There is no control operator that is well, not being to. used by at least one SEO. <laughs> I know you want to stop this, but I'm I'm confused by something. It, ultimately, the validator I want to be in my embedded device. Oh, sorry, Dave Robin, maker of embedded devices. <laughs> I want to get a Seabor message in. I want to be able to validate it based on some compiler that looked at the CDDL and told my device how to validate it. Now, if you can say everything can be replaced by one gigantic regex expression, then I'm going to give it to a human to figure out how to actually write the code to do that validation, because I don't have a regex interpreter in the embedded environment. So let's not go overboard and say, we don't need CDDL, it's just one big regex expression. So the, 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 opt the constraints are easily turned into embedded rules. Don't go crazy with things that can superset those constraints. Those constraints can be easily turned into embedded rules. All right, next. Next. Um, so the um, CBOR specification itself, um, as you know, our job is to take this uh, to, to a standards level, and there are several things we uh, need to do. And uh, th there is a process defined in RFC 6410 for doing that, so those of you who are not familiar with that uh, process, uh, please uh, have a look. Um, yeah, we have some 45 implementations, so it, it should not be too hard to point out to independent implementations, whether they are interoperable, that, that's what we need to find out. As, as Joe has said, we have fixed the errata. Uh, while looking at interoperability, we can look at whether we have unused uh, features, and as far as I know, we don't have any patent claims uh, that are known so far. So the, the status of the document um, is that dash zero zero had already fixed the uh, errata, and uh, dash oh one uh, has reacted to a few uh, comments that have been made by implementers. Uh, one is that that uh, the the way the simple types like false true null and so on are encoded is uh, uh, said again in another place, so it, it's harder to miss um, the, the way they are defined. Uh, we added a changes section, maybe in the next version we will uh, separate editorial changes, fixes, and, and new information from each other. And the, the only real new material is the uh, new section about CBOR uh, data models. And maybe we should quickly talk about that. Um, so those people who have worked uh, with uh, JSON generally like it. Uh, however, it's not always clear what the data model actually is that is being derived from a JSON uh, instance. And uh, if you really paid attention, 
you could infer the SIBO data model from RFC 7049. Uh, but maybe it's better to actually make this very explicit. Uh, so uh, th there is a proposal for a new section 2.5, uh, which is called generic data model. Generic because it's not about a specific data model, a specific application might be using, but it's about the complete set of uh, uh, instances that can be uh, realized in, in SIBO. And that generic data model comes in two parts. Uh, one is the unextended basic data model, and the other half is the extension points. Um, of course, given that the extension points are there for extending SIBO, uh, that data model is not closed. People can come in and, and define new parts of that uh, data model. Uh, but uh, the SIBO document already comes with 18 uh, predefined uh, tags and uh, four uh, simple uh, items, false, true, null, undefined. And of course, th there are uh, now a couple dozen uh, tags uh, defined uh, in an IANA registry. So th this is um, probably a useful thing because the generic data model makes it more explicit what we actually expect from an implementer of generic encoders and decoders. Because an encoder and decoder translates between the data model and the serialization. And it's not enough to just uh, specify the serialization if you expect generic encoders and decoders to interoperate. And an ecosystem of such gen generic encoders and decoders makes interoperability so much more likely, and also guides the definition of specific data models because you won't define data models in such a way that generic encoders and decoders have uh, problems uh, with them. So this is uh, uh, one uh, addition which could be called editorial, except there, there's also a little bit of text in there that clarifies some expectations. And um, the, the, the batteries included aspect of uh, RFC 7049 is not, um, uh, not appropriate if you need to ship SIBO by, by uh, airmail. So you, sometimes you have to leave out the batteries. And uh, the question is, which, which batteries do we really want to have in there? Which of the pre-extensions by the document are really basic? And uh, section 2.5 now clarifies that the three simple data items, false, true, null, uh, do come in through an extension point, but they, they are really not an extension. They, they are part of uh, what is expected to be provided in a generic encoder and decoder. That still doesn't mean that a data model that you define using SIBO has to use them. But it means if you write a generic encoder and decoder, please include uh, false, true, and null. And everything else is truly optional and a matter of implementation quality. So that's a statement, and that's probably a statement we want to be very clear about in this working group, whether that's what we expect from generic decoders. So again, the, 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 this is relevant for interoperability because this ecosystem of generic encoders and decoders uh, helps ga uh, gaining interoperability. But it's not a 2119 type of must or must not. It's just an expectation. And we, we historically have had a little bit of a problem in, in the ITF managing these expectations. So it, it's a little bit of an unusual way of specifying things. Okay. So if you have any comment on that, that would be something that, that would be really useful on the mailing list or on the microphone. Oh, well, it's... Maybe it's just a typo, Sean Leonard. Um, in your slide, it says anything else, including undefined, is truly optional. But in draft 01, which is posted, undefined is actually in the third category of is has it? to be supported. Yeah. Okay. I, at I least that's what I just we checked. Had fixed that, but, uh, so, uh, which, which one are you proposing? Because it seems I'm that. I'm proposing false, true, and null, just these three as uh, core elements and everything, including undefined as optional okay i think i think undefined is is useful too in the prior category a that's just my two cents useful. a lot I of things are useful yes well i guess there's a difference between null and undefined especially when undefined is used for items that didn't decode properly or whatever you know 
it is. Whereas null is like explicit null. I probably have a recommended set I would give to an implementer that includes a couple of those tags and, and undefined and a few more things uh, that they should be doing. But uh, this is trying to say we really expect people to do the JSON three false true and not. So if people don't, other people in the room have comments right now, otherwise we can move this to the main list and hopefully uh, yeah, get feedback there. Okay, the, the other thing that uh, came up, um, as you know, we have a few implementations out there. Last time I looked, it, it was 45. Um, it's it's uh, changing every week now. Um, and um, we, we haven't got a lot of uh, uh, feedback about uh, uh, interoperability uh, problems, but we do have one. And uh, that is really not a problem in CBOR. It's a problem in the world we are bridging to, uh, which is the base 64 world, that has had a little bit of an evolution since base 64 was first defined for MIME. And we probably haven't been tracking that evolution uh, very well. So we have uh, four tags defined that have something to do with uh, base 64. Uh, two of them are for base 64 URL, which is what we, you would use today. And uh, two of them are for base 64 classic. And there is no known problem with the base 64 URL ones, but uh, with base 64 classic, it's all a little bit more fuzzy. And um, right now, we are very clear in the definition of tag 21 that base 64 URL is being used uh, without padding. We are not saying that explicitly for tag 33. So that, that may be a problem, but then um, RFC 4648 has some more text about that. Uh, the base 64 classic tags, 22 and 34, uh, they reference 4648, but 4648 only has um, essentially decision criteria. If you are using base 64, those are the reasons why you want, why, might want to use padding, and those are the reasons why you might not want to um, use it. Um, yeah, so what we have to decide, uh, first, uh, do we really mean tag 33 to also be limited to base 64 URL without padding? And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we do want to do that, uh, but we should make a conscious decision. And uh, on the, the base 64 classic side, we have to do a few no-brainers, like saying we don't really expect white space in there, or uh, we don't expect line length limitations, uh, which some base 64 implementations have. Um, but it's probably not sufficient to just say anything goes. Um, in particular, tag 21 and 22 are intended to be acted upon by a CBOR to JSON converter, which might be generic. So it has no idea what the application requirements on that base 64 are. Uh, so we have to tell this generic converter what kind of base 64 it's supposed to uh, generate. So the problem is really urgent for the tag 22 because people cannot implement this right now without the <laughs> knowledge. They, they, they have to pick a choice and you shouldn't let implementers pick something. And the second thing is, um, yeah, tag 33 and 34 just say Here's a, here is a text string, and by the way, the semantics of the text string is base 64, base 64 URL or base 64 uh, classic. Now, this could be interpreted in a more permissive way, because uh, the, the, the tag just provides information, and we, we could be happy with that information being, uh, it, it's some kind of, of base 64, but we, we are not going to tell you uh, which one. But then uh, it also is a little bit harder to, to do a conversion, conversion to JSON uh, where the uh, JSON data model of, uh, on the other side might have more strict uh, requirements on the base 64. Um, so th these are two different but interrelated uh, sets of uh, problems. And this, of course, should be guided by how base 64 classic and URL are being used in practice. 
Now, base64 URL is almost always used without padding. I remember having seen once a version with padding, but I'm not even sure that that was standards compliant. Um, so interoperability might benefit from really nailing this one down. And uh, on the base64 side, uh, it's pretty much a bike shed. So it, it's not really possible to uh, decide this well. Um, yeah, so we, we could be more explicit about tag 33. Uh, we could define tag 22 and 34 uh, as with or without padding. We could also go ahead and define additional tags, base 64 classic with padding, without padding, with up to 70 characters per line. Uh, probably not. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's also a question that, that occasionally comes up about base 16. So. Uh, you can write hex strings in uppercase and lowercase, but th th that's a sidetrack um, right now. So uh, my proposal would be to actually read 4648, uh, which tells us padding was designed to help with situations in which the decoder isn't quite sure about what the length is. Uh, in CBOR, we always know the length. So it's really the no padding case from 4648 uh, that we have here. Now again, the, the JSON side of a potential automatic conversion might have other constraints. So maybe the JSON side then next converts into a MIME message or something like that. Um, so th this is not, not a perfect argument, um, but it's an argument that might be used to, to solve that uh, bike shed. Uh, so uh, my proposal would be to, to uh, go for no padding uh, with base64 classic 2 but add some uh, language, some implementation note that this was only added, this clarification was only added now, and asking implementers to be particularly liberal about uh, what they accept. Who in this room cares about Base64? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean Leonard. So I think. Uh, the, the core issue here is that you want different implementations to emit the same basic, the same sequence of characters, right, for base64, whether it's uppercase, lowercase, padding, or whatever, right? So, uh, first of all, the question is why? Uh, I mean, is there a, like, and when I say why, I mean, is there like a canonicalization issue where you really need it that way because otherwise some digital signature or hash is not going to compute correctly or something like that, or, or what is it? And then the second is, there is, I'm not saying we should do this, but another possibility is that you consider all the different permutations and you just register lots of high tag numbers for all of them. So I think that that's not a good idea, but that is a way to like deal with it. And we just pick something arbitrarily for the current ones that we believe is gonna be the most common. Uh, Dave Taylor. So I'm partly up here to respond to Joe's question. Uh, does anybody care about Base64? Um, in the uh, so OCF is one of the organizations that has dependencies on CBOR, right? And I just wanted to report that um, that OCF you to express schemas, right? They use both um, uh, RAML and JSON schema, and now moving towards Swagger. And both JSON schema and Swagger have the property of defining a type for base64 and not defining a type for base64 URL. And so that means that they use base64 URL not because they want to, even though they're using CPOR on the wire, but because of other external dependencies, they're using base64. So uh, yeah, and so the implementation they're using is tiny CBOR, and I don't know what that does, but offhand, I'm guessing your proposal would be fine, but I have to check with the tiny CBOR um, author. Uh, but yep. OCF would care, and offhand, I'm guessing your proposal would be fine, but I will have to check. Yeah, that, that's a very sad thing that you just reported, but... Uh... The tiny Seabor author really laments the fact that he can't use the base64 URL that's in the tiny Seabor implementation for OCF, because there's no reason other than the specification language having to use uh, previously JSON schema and now Swagger. Um, and if we could get both of those, uh, or I should say either of those fixed, the tiny seaport author would be very elated. So, uh, Matthew Miller. Um, so, 
for me, most of the time it's it's base64 URL and not base64. Where it is base64, it's because of trying to interoperate with existing tools, um, which will spit out whatever they spit out. But the parsing of that usually, their accepting of things is usually pretty permissive in the first place. So I think I don't. So I think it's worth uh, moving in that direction for the 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 thirty x set of tags. Just let it let it be pretty flexible there. Um, where but on the other side, just remove all the white space and. The safest that I've seen for that is also make sure to keep the padding for base64 versus base64 URL. It's almost never padding. But let's, it's OK to be permissive on what, what we take, but on what you're going to generate, just set some really strong limits. So this is one vote for permissive on the, the 34 and uh, defining the 22. Joe Hildebrand, um, so I'm going to. I'm going to argue for the complete other side, which is to remove all four of these tags from Seabor because I find them useless. You should just use byte strings. So that ship having sailed, I frankly don't care what goes into these because I think they're useless. Yeah, okay. so, sounds good to me. Uh, okay. They are register tags, so they, they are not going away, but we could take them away from the standard. Okay, so let's, uh, Carsten, can you start a thread on this on the mailing list? And people, uh, also those who have uh, talked here, please respond to the thread. And we'll take a quick decision, because it seems like this is just something that needs to be decided on, and it's not really controversial. Okay. So uh, Joe already mentioned that uh, we have to do work on the implementation metrics. I, I neglected to put a link on, on your code. On, on the slide. Uh, so maybe you can send that again to the mailing list. Um, so uh, right now, again, uh, Joe has done his homework. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, is anyone in this room who, who can do their homework on this? Jim can do that. Karsten also raised his hand. So w which implementation would you do that homework for? Pardon me? Peters, Peter Achill, however you, yes. Okay, so that, that's a, please do. So, so I poke myself and uh, what else do we have? Oh, then we have four, so that, that's already a good uh, thing. But if we have more, that's, uh, that's of course. So just better. for the record, they said that he could uh, do four tiny C Thank you. OK, that's all I had on the CBOBIS document. Now, the, the last uh, set of items on the agenda is, is CBOR tags, various CBOR tag documents. And um, again, RFC 7049 predefines 18 tags. Maybe it's 14 when we, when we are done today. Um, th there's stuff in there. Uh, but the point is, it's it's easy to register your own CBOR tags. It may even be too easy at the moment. Um, and um, th there are more than 20 more tags, some of them defined by the IGF, for instance, the COSI and CWT tags. Um, but people have come in and, and done tags for Perl support, for Haskell support. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, tagged, language tagged string, which is really an important addition. Uh, compression and so on. So just as one example, uh, what, what's uh, going to be completed very soon is the CBOR web token, uh, which is essentially the, the JSON web token uh, translated uh, to CBOR that packages a claim set uh, into uh, JSON. And then you can um, apply a COSI uh, security to that in, in various forms. So uh, here we have tag 61 assigned. Uh, already, we didn't even have to do an early allocation for that because the, the uh, registration policy right now is very liberal. And uh, the working group last call for the CBO web token uh, completed in the IETF ACE working group and will soon go into IETF last call. So that's an example for a tag document that uh, we are doing because we have a standard uh, that, that actually uh, uses that. 
We also have some other tags drafts that are not necessarily being motivated by specific standards, but are being motivated by wanting to do a specification work that references certain types of data structures. So one of this is the OID draft, and at some point, Joan and I have to, to sit down and uh, uh, see what uh, we actually want to push through here at the moment and what maybe should go into a separate a document, but if you have feedback on that document, that would be useful. But I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. The second one is the array tags uh, draft, which has been out for a while and has been pretty stable for a while. Um, that is still waiting for working group adoption. I will talk about that in a minute. The third one is the time tag, which is off charter, and essentially is, is completed process-wise, because the IANA has registered an FCFS tag uh, for it, the 1001. Um, but maybe we actually want to turn this into an RFC, and I'd, I'd like to understand what this working group, when it has completed its current charter, uh, wants to do with us. Does this working group care or not? Um, oops, um, then we have the, the template. Uh, tag, but that's really something that, that is over in LP WAN and not here, so maybe this should be any other group of tags motivated by standardization activities. And then maybe at some point we may want to do a useful tags document because some of those registered uh, tags are actually very useful and it would be good to collect their specifications into an RFC uh, so people have an easier way of referencing those and we, we don't have down refs for document that uh, use that. And th that useful tag document actually could swallow the, the time uh, tag as well, if we consider that uh, useful. So that's one way of uh, handling it. Um, questions about that? Okay, then, then let's go into the array tag. Um, th that is currently in version 06, but there haven't been many technical changes. There have been small editorial adjustments in, in the last uh, draft. And this is uh, inspired by JavaScript. Um, it defines 24 uh, contiguous tags in the two-byte space. Um, and um, it also defines two more tags for other homogeneous arrays, which is useful in, in a decoder if you know uh, ahead of time uh, this array of 4,000 elements uh, you are finding is actually homogeneous, so you can map it to uh, whatever homogeneous you have in your language and a tag for multi-dimensional arrays. So when, when you get the, the elements enumerated, you know uh, how many columns and how many rows there are. So I think these are pretty non-controversial, uh, but for those, of course, uh, eating up 24 uh, tags um, is, is maybe uh, uh, a lot, and eating them out of the two-byte space is maybe even more of a lot. Uh, we have 232. There are about 20 taken at this point in time. But uh, I mean, this is about the, the size of the IP protocol number uh, space. So we want to be a little bit careful about that. And we have, have had arguments on both sides. Uh, one is it would be a waste of space because arrays can be large. And large arrays obviously are fine with a three byte tag. And the other uh, argument is uh, no, arrays can also be small. And one of the most uh, likely usages of this tag is for an RGB value, which is three bytes. And uh, yeah, then you need ad adding a three byte tag to a three byte value, th that's uh, maybe not so bright. Um, what we could do is partition those 24 tags uh, into those that, that are uh, somehow big, and, and those that, that are somehow not so big, that's ugly. I'd, I'd rather spend those 24 tags um, at once. But even more importantly, um, I would like to get this out of the way. For some reason, this, ha this has kept us from adopting this draft, which is weird because we usually adopt drafts before we have solved all technical issues with them. Um, so let, let's get this out of the way. Joe Hildebrand, uh, from the floor. We, this pattern comes up relatively frequently where somebody has like one general concept that they want to put into a tag 
and then a bunch of different potential ways it might be used. And one of the ways of dealing with that is you assign a large number of these sorts of, of tags in order to make that happen. It is possible that we could come up with a pattern for parameterized tags effectively, where you say, here is a tag for a two, um, a two place array, where the first thing in the array is the parameter, and the second thing in the array is the actual modif the, the actual thing that the, that the tag. Like um, decimal, for instance. Decimal is exactly that pattern. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so having that pattern more so sort of in our pocket and with a name that we call whatever this, you know, uh, pr pr parameterized uh, tag, for instance, would allow us to, 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 to shorthand the discussion. And then so my next question here was, well, could we do a parameterized tag for this where we have one tag specified, in which case having one in the one byte range even might be fine. And then you'd have another byte for the array. So a total of two bytes to describe the whole thing. Well, you actually need the three and then three, one for the, three. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. total of three bytes um, for this. Uh, I don't know if that's too many bytes, if that's, or is it too complicated, et cetera. I do agree that having these set of JavaScript types expressible easily in Seaboard would be nice. So. OK, Sean Leonard. Uh, so to continue off of Joe's point, actually, the um, Seaboard tags OID draft actually discusses that premise of uh, having stacked or parameterized tags, where you have a tag uh, which is small and then another uh, identifier next to it, which could be another tag because you can, in fact, stack tags you know, on top of tag, or an integer. It's worth pointing out that in Seabor, a tag is really just an unsigned integer with major type 6, I believe, instead of major type 0. Otherwise, they're like literally the same. And the semantics, of course, are that no, you can put one thing after it, which is the thing that's being tagged. A tag also has a data item. An integer doesn't have a data item. Co correct, correct. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That's correct, yeah. Um, that's the difference. Um, with regard to this particular thing, I think the draft should be adopted, and I think all the tag drafts should be adopted, and we should just get it over with. Um, I have, I think in prior uh, meetings, Joe expressed, let's put it in the three-byte space. I basically think for this block, we should just put in three byte space and not use the two byte space. Uh, but the premise of allocating blocks of tags to take it or exploit mathematical properties, like the fact that you know these are interleaved, is a good thing, especially because we are trying to optimize for IoT you know types of constrained devices, where then this can be part of a jump table effectively, right? With one subtract and then jump to wherever you need to go. Um, with regard to the bike shed issue of, you know, three byte tags, two byte tags. If we have, if we literally have an RGB value that's three bytes, we just give it another tag for heaven's sakes. You know, like if it's going to be an array of lots and lots of RGB values because it is the contents of a graphic buffer or whatever from one computing device to another, that's going to be a large array. So the tag's not going to contribute to it. And if it's just one, just invent some RGB tag. You can put in the one byte space, the two byte space, or just just call it a day, you know? Or, or, or I will point out, this is a good point to point out, you don't actually have to tag anything at all. If you're really super space constrained on the wire or whatever, just don't tag it. Just have some huge, huge ass array of integers or whatever. That gets me to the issue of when should we tag? And some of the OID draft, which is admittedly a bit of a kitchen sink, does go into those philosophical issues, right? When should we tag it all? The problem with uh, things prior to CBOR, uh, like ASN1, which I'm unfortunately intimately familiar with, is that there are all these options for tagging. You can make tagging explicit, you can make it implicit, you can make it automatic, which nobody knows what does, just the, the parser does whatever, right? 
Uh, and you can reassign tags from one universal class to another. So something that's labeled an, a universal integer, maybe it's not an integer. Maybe it's who knows whatever the heck it is. I think a real advantage to CBOR, which is not mandated by RFC 7049, but comes out of it, is that we've got this really awesome large tag space and one registry where once you register it, that's it for all applications. And so I'd like to propose and volunteer to take some of the work I've done on this and kind of develop a philosophy of CBOR tagging internet draft that the working group look at and adopt. So we can all say, yeah, you know, this is how you should use tags, which mostly is use them explicitly. But if your application doesn't need them, just don't use tags at all and be okay with that. And with respect to, that's good because if we agree as a whole, if we're going to use tags in a specification, it's always, everything's going to be explicitly tagged and that's just the way it is. It's going to be great for debugging, right? Because you get a Wireshark trace or whatever, everything is tagged, right? And they're not that big, just a couple of bytes, but you know exactly what it is. It's that weird RGB thing for Com Commodore 64, whatever, back in the 80s. That's what it is. You know exactly what it is. No big deal. It's a four byte tag out and there's a billion other different tags, all right? Different numbers. We're not running out. So that's my proposal. Joe Hildebrand from the floor again. I think that that would be a useful discussion for us to have and having a draft to start from, I don't, oh, wherever Sean went, there you are. Uh, he's standing in my blind spot now, or sitting in my blind spot. Uh, having a draft to start that discussion I think would be useful. Um, so uh, coming back to this, like if, so again, this is just me speaking as an individual. If you moved all this stuff into the three byte space just to, to get us to the point where it's adopted and then we could have a further discussion, um, that might be the most expedient way okay. to, to, to get past this. Um, so I don't know if you're, if you're... So from from last meeting, the point was uh, many people, seven people, around seven people had read uh, the draft, and the thing that was missing was reviews. And we had people volunteer, but then uh, no reviews. So we need to get these reviews. <laughs> so on on the philosophical question of whether you want to have a tag with a parameter space or use uh, tags with their mathematical property as an integer. I agree with Sean that that's a good pattern to have. We have 18 trillion tags, so we, we can do this a lot before we run out. Um, in the particular RGB example, the, the tag is actually useful uh, because uh, you would use uint8 if you are in, in the classical RGB space, and you would use binary 16 if you are using high dynamic range. So you actually need the tag to decide which of the two cases you have. Good, good point. Or, or at that point, yeah, you could just you could have two tags at that point. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But why why don't we just provide those twenty four for the applications that need this kind of thing and be done with it? For one tag with a big swath that you can. Mike. Oh, he said he'd like one tag that you can do mathematical operations on, like jump tables. Computational. Computational, yeah. Yeah, th th this computes on tags, but to, to be able to compute on tags, you need several of them. So I, I like Joe's suggestion to, to turn it into three byte tags for, for a week, have it adopted, and then do the, uh, the actual discussion whether we want to. Do yeah, I mean, that, that at least gets us past this sort of like philosophical question and like advances us from a process perspective and allows this uh, this document that Sean was talking about to get written as a way for us to explore our feelings a little bit so ju just as just as another data point uh, th there are a number of uh, um, um, IANA registration requests lined up right now that want to go into this space so this space wouldn't be available if we go for those registrations, just as a data point. Yes, uh, Alexander uh, here. 
So I really like the idea about the document that says, you know, this is the way we should be, you know, treating tax. This, this is in the way we should be using them. So if you go with this, uh, I'll be willing to to review it or, you know, just express some opinions. So thanks, if thanks for starting this. Uh, and uh, yeah, about this tax, like, I mean, for me, a tag is something that, like, it, it's a tag. You don't part attach like semantics on it. It's it's something that says, well, the thing that follows is this, right? So I really like the idea of being able to do some mathematical miracles with it and do some jump tables or something. But I'm not sure if this attaching semantics to the things it's not violating the idea about the tag itself like for me a tag is like it the fact that it's a number it, it it's just like an implementational detail it could have been like a big string so having these things it could could work like but you know i i'm not sure it's it's something we would like to start doing at some point because here now we have some you find some neat thing to do with it and then maybe tomorrow we find some other new neat things to do with some new tags so we say okay we have some other jump so we have starting code to the tags and and and, and you know with the example with the rgb so what happens if okay you have you need to make the distinction between uint and binary 16 to make sure that your rgb is in one case or the other case like dynamic range or non-dynamic range so what happens if your application doesn't use, use tax anymore at some point you say okay well in some other case you want to be super efficient so you don't or you have some parser that says okay i'm just going to strip yeah, tax because you know it's not you change the specific data model this is the yeah. generic data model this is all you can do and uh, if we define it this way then a specific data model can just say an rgb value is three numbers and and use one of the tags that is being defined here i mean they are still in a table Right, so you don't have to do the the arithmetic with a tag, if you only care for a few of them. It's just expedient for for a generic uh, encoder and decoder implementation to be able to use the table. Um, so you would say um, an RGB value is either a triple of U and eight or a triple of binary sixteen, and then you're done. Okay, uh, I mean that, that's a separate point from the one that you that was saying. But uh, what I say is that in this case, if you remove the tag, then you cannot parse anymore the the you cannot make this distinction between is it dynamic range or is it something fixed so just just saying that but that that was like a, a minor point the, the other point was might be more important that do we want to make this explicit like mathematical thing on top of the text uh sean leonard i think the general design pattern is not specific to seaboard to tags it's just when you have uh, when you're computing, right, you can have a huge if else sequence of statements, which is not necessarily, it may or may not be parallelizable. But if you can have a large range of contiguous choices uh, and then perform a single mathematical operation and jump to the right place uh, or, or, you know, compute that, then uh, things go a lot faster and can be done in much less code. So it's just a, like a general pattern of allocating the same numbers in the same block that do similar things for the same reason that ASCII zero to nine just happened to be in the hex pattern uh, 30 to 39. Because if you subtract 48 from them, then you actually have the number in binary. It's the same exact premise. Yes. Okay, but we seem to have consensus on, on going for three byte tags for the next version, doing the adoption call, and then me complaining loudly to the mailing list that it should be two byte tags. Um, now, quickly about the, the time tag. Um, so the, just, a, just a note, now we have finished with the chartered items and the time tag is unchartered. Just. Thank you. Yeah, I already said that, but it's good to say that again. So the, the time tag came up uh, because the, the Haskell programming, programming language has pretty much adopted CBOR as their preferred binary serialization technique. And in Haskell, times are based on picoseconds. Uh, so we needed a, a way to represent a time based on picoseconds. And the, the Haskell people wanted to have tags so they really can see in the serialized data, this is a time and not just an, any array of, of data or something like that. So they wrote up 
uh, uh, document and I helped them a little bit uh, with, with completing that. And uh, they got uh, FCFS uh, registration. Now, um, we could document this tag if we think it is useful. Um, we, it's not only used for, for picoseconds, it can also be used for nanoseconds, microseconds, or uh, milliseconds. So all, all the cases when you don't want to do the computation of uh, converting uh, one of these pairs of, of seconds and a subunit of seconds into a single number, it, it's useful to, to have this kind of uh, attack. So it's pretty general in its usage. And um, we could also go ahead and add more of what, what was in the original proposal for the time tag uh, to it. So the, there's, there was thing, were things like time zones and, and other information that could go in there or, or could not. So these are all, all ways of taking it forward. And um, I would just like to know, uh, should I talk to the independent submissions editor tomorrow and say this becomes an RFC on its own? If yes, he will come to the working group and ask, is this the runaround through the working group? And uh, so the working group will have to have an opinion on that. Um, or should I wait for the working group to complete its current charter and then work on making this a work group document or including it in a set of useful tags or but but have the working group work on it i would like the opinion of our ad on this I think I mostly have an opinion whether you should complete other work items before this one, but I have I have an opinion of, on whether you should complete other work items first before accepting this. But other than that, you know, I think it's very fair co question if you want to pull pull the room to see how many people are interested in working on this. which can inform Karsten's decision, you know, you know, which way to take it. Okay, uh, Sean Leonard. So I think this is fine as a working group item with Alexi's caveat that we should work on the first things first that we are chartered for. Um, an interesting bookkeeping question, which I believe is completely bike shedding, is do you want to allocate a block for bookkeeping purposes of seaboard tags, just to time stuff. So we just say 1,001 to 1,100 or whatever is all the time tags we'll ever need. And we then did. somebody. We, we have a block of three tags for uh, times, periods, and intervals. So oh, of three tags or of like three? three? Okay. Okay. But I'm saying like, you know, we just, just reserve 300 tags. We just say, oh, somebody's coming up with some weird time format. Or do we have a block of tags for Haskell things, right? So it's like programming language specific. Like all the Perl stuff is in 3,000 to 4,000 and the Haskell stuff is 4,000. But I don't know. I don't know. I can include something along that in the doc in the document of philosophy of tagging if, if that's important to people. Um, I just see this as there's an opportunity to look at what are the underlying things that motivate CBORs, you know, advantages over other serialization formats. And one of those is efficiency of the encoders and decoders. I believe that's explicitly mentioned in 7049 as the motivating case. So to the extent that we are trying to support IoT devices, resource constrained devices, you know, devices that want to just work very fast on data, hopefully that will inform whether we have a large number of time tags or whatever um, to make the encoding and decoding of these things faster for devices and easier for devices than and protocols that actually need to do them. So um, yeah, with that said, if we delve any more into time tags, I really want some subject matter expert on this thing because I'm not an expert in time. We got an NTP working group. There's got to be some people in there who know all about this time stuff much better than me. Yeah, it helped that Joe Touch was writing a document about uh, times at the time that, that this was discussed. So this document contains a reference to Joe Touch's. Okay, so maybe we can, can 
take the poll of who's actually interested to work on this on to the mailing list. Who would be interested in uh, working on this in this? Who would be interested in this topic here? So, to be clear, who wants us to do after we're done with our chartered items? Who wants <laughs> us to do more work on time formats, including this one, perhaps just time formats in general? Let's start with that. Hands who think we want to work on that here. Hank, you have to raise an arm if, if you have one, to spare one. Uh, All right, so that's two people, including one of Hank's eyebrows. Yeah, I can do one. Yeah, All right, three. All right, S that's, I think, useful, but not, I mean, this is not a, this is more of a straw poll kind of, of question, not a, don't work on this, but I didn't see a large thundering herd of folk who were interested in doing more there. Yes, Alexa. Yeah, I think it's sort of an indicative, but it doesn't have to be binding. You can ask the question once you actually do those other Absolutely. things. But, but yep. yeah. Okay. Do you want anything else there? All right. No, I'm done. All right. So let's talk just a little bit more about uh, CDDL while we've got everybody here. Um, does anybody think that we ought to do a ton more work on CDDL before we publish Rev0. Any any hands of people who think that we ought to do add a bunch more stuff before we publish? There's a quizzical look, I see. Do, do people think we ought to, well, I'm going to ask the opposite question. Do people think that we're like pretty close, we should go into polish mode and just get the thing out the door? Like raise your hands if you think we're there. All right, so I, I see a good number of hands for that. <laughs> I see some people raising two hands. Alexi is going to clarify. I, I'm going to um, start applying uh, slight pressure as area director on uh, any document that normative reference CDDL uh, is not going to, you know, it ha either has to have a normative reference or it will have a discuss on it. So. Okay, that's so. I think so get it that, done. We, sh we should probably get it done. Um, I do want to point out one of the other ads asked me about um, using CDDL for JSON, and he hadn't seen uh, Appendix E um, out of the the current CDDL spec. So, uh, Alexi, if you could just keep your eyes open for people questioning if they're allowed to use CDDL for JSON, whatever "allowed" means, there is. That appendix in the, the current CDDL draft. Well, he does now because I sent him the link. Um, so, if there's anybody else that wants us to do more work there before we're done enough, and I used the air quotes there, uh, before we're done enough for people to use this in their JSON specs, then the IASG should let us know. Because if we're going to move into quick polish and get it out mode, we're not going to add anything else other than what's in that um, in that appendix talking about JSON. So this is a hey, if you would mind mentioning this to the rest of the IESG, see if anybody else has an issue. Otherwise, we're just going to plow ahead. So, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is that I think we believe, and I'm that Appendix E is enough to motivate using CDDL for describing JSON protocols. If the IESG wants something more than that appendix, say something that feels a little bit more normative or a separate doc that describes how to do it or anything like that, we would like them to speak up immediately and give us a little bit more direction. Other than without hearing anything like that, we're going to move ahead assuming that Appendix E is roughly exactly what's needed. OK, sorry. Because I haven't actually looked at Appendix E, I cannot provide a useful personal no, no, comment. And I'm not asking for you to tell me the answer to this right, right. now. I'm asking if over the course of maybe tomorrow at and, the wrap-up, you yeah. ask. Or at least point people to it and tell them that that's what it's going to be unless they tell us something different. OK. There's already one RSC published that uh, references CDA for JSON. Informatively. Okay. 
be careful when you give me action items, I give them back. <laughs> All right, anybody have any other concerns? If we're gonna put CDDL on this short time frame, which sounds like we really ought to at this point, does anybody else have any other concerns or potential roadblocks? things that we ought to aggressively pull out in order to fix things so they're like the regular expression thing like I would maybe put that on the bubble if we don't have a normative reference to point to for regular expressions are you are you okay with that Sean uh, Sean Leonard so yeah so my whole thing is I don't want us to be committed to all these bucket load of features Yes. that we may want to change you know or improve or whatever later on so i so you know i i uh am resigned to the fact that we got to publish something right and we got to keep people's yeah. work going there's no not really a question that but we need to also be clear it's version zero yes. and we're trying to you know add these useful things and think, all that i think you know. we're going to have to do this of cddl yeah. basically we'll start that as soon as we get the first one in the can yeah and so like the the mode here should be if we can't come to consensus quickly on exactly what it ought to look like if we don't have a reference for the thing for whatever reason we'll rip the feature out and we'll put it back in this right right and yeah like i said my i have concerns about like i said the control operators in general not because they're not useful but because like is somebody really using these now and well you know, like give, give people, us a few yeah. weeks or the version one to like right. figure it all out you so know? Uh, hank can you quickly comment whether a certain three-letter organization would have a problem with regex being taken out oh. do that later yeah yeah do, so do that on the so I, all, all i'm saying is that if we can't come to consensus on these things quickly now I'm also now that we understand sort of what polish mode would mean, I'm also okay with somebody going up to the mic and saying, "No, no, no, we're not quite ready for that." And I'm not seeing anybody running to the mic. All right, so this is just, hey, we need to be able to finish. Okay. Cheba relay from. Uh uh, Karu uh, Maeda, or some variation of that pronunciation. Uh, regex is good at finding something matches. However, bad at detecting something does not match. Bad regex patterns might lead to a DOS. Relying on regex for validator could be risky. Please send that to the list. Um, that is an entire separate discussion. Um, one of the things, Sean, that we probably ought to put in the doc that you proposed is a talk about how much these sorts of things should be used for generating validators at runtime versus being used as a mechanism of documenting what the validators ought to do. Um, and I know that that is a place where Tim Bray in particular has had very strong opinions in the past and the way that we got to being able to do some of the CDDL work it was talking about it in terms of describing what the interoperability properties should be and not about generating right. validators. Right, so uh, Joe, this is Sean Leonard. So just a question, are you referring to the philosophy of tagging document? Yeah, that was the one I was talking about. Oh, uh, no, no, oh, no, because no. uh, so, no, so, yeah, because so, you, you, your comment was addressed more to CDDL. Yes. Right, yes. okay. Completely unrelated and I had, Completely. had, had okay. in my mind, it was one big philosophy document. Okay, no reason. problem. Yeah, because I am I am of the view or opinion that it's more descriptive than about validation. I'm also, I recognize people will want to validate things, but the point is to describe, and we want to emphasize that. And one way to do that is to kind of put some focus on the fact that if stuff doesn't, if you have data that doesn't conform to the CDDL, it's not necessarily a fatal error, okay? This is not XML land. It's more like markdown land. If it doesn't quite fit, that's okay. Still work with it. Just so there's going to be a not variety way, of opinions there. That, so. That's not the way we use this. We use this for defining protocols, and uh, if the protocol is not being followed, then you have an error. All right. So let's not bog down in that particular philosophical hole. Well, there are different ways of using Absolutely it. So the, uh, Sean's way is also another yes. way of using it. All right. 
me go back to what I was talking about with CDDL. So let's make sure that anything that we don't have pretty good consensus on or anything that we don't have good references for or anything that's not done, we can start ripping that stuff out, get a version zero out the door so that other people can refer to it. That should be a pretty high priority for us over the next several weeks. And I don't see anybody, dis I see some nodding heads. I don't see anybody shaking their head. I don't see anybody jumping up to the mic to, all right, go ahead. <laughs> I'll jump up to the mic. Uh, it's Dave Robin. I was just going to say, with the exception of regex, which gets into the whole philosophical about it, what's it used for, can it be used for generating uh, validators? I think if you take that out and you look at the rest of it, I can easily make a validator code out of it. It's, it's, it's fairly strict. I mean, we had some matching questions here that we talked about, but for the most part, I can automate a, val a validator from that. So I'm just saying that's, that's okay. With the regex is more of a explaining to a human to give to my coder to write some rules. And that, that breaks everything. All right. So let's, have, let's finish off that discussion right. on the mailing list. Hank's about to jump up because he sees the way the wind is blowing. In regard to the three-letter acronym SEO, regex is not uh, vital. Uh, within is. What is? Within control. Oh, within. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe that's that's a quick way out of this for the short term. Is would be to remove the regex control. Is anybody else going to have heartburn from that? Did you say that? All right. So we're going to valid. We're going to talk about that on the list. See if anybody has an issue with it. That would be a way for us to move forward, get the thing out the door, and we can add regexes back in in version one or version two or whatever we're going to call it. All right. Anything else we need to talk about? What's that? Okay. Go Two minutes. Just remind again, uh, please participate in the mailing list, subscribe, and I would be personally interested to hear about people that are using CDDL for CDDL and implementers of CBOR. Um, so I, I see a lot of people here that I, I have not seen in the mailing list talk. A lot, so please make sure you're in the main list. All right. Any last comments? Does is there anybody that didn't get the blue sheets? Do we have the other blue sheet handy? Can somebody raise it up for me somewhere where I can see it? Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. That's all. Is Miles here? Yeah. It's because I'm not on. I think so. What's that? The minutes. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes. So, um, I'll downgrade it to a comment. I, there was a bit of misunderstanding, but what you guys did wasn't quite right. Just the paging thing? Yes. Because you updated the definition and sort of was with. No, it's like Well, I, I initially thought it was wrong, as in Euro defined link relations instead of defining new ones, but Mark explained that actually. No, you're right. But but because you don't, instead of you know just doing it by reference, you repeated the text with modifications. That's all. Sort of